What is Visit Cornwall? Is it part of Cornwall Council or is it something else? Uh, Visit Cornwall was created when the council withdrew all public money back in 2015 and it is a community interest company. Um, so it's a bit like the fish producers or anybody. It's an industry membership body there to look after the sector. It has members, um, but maybe a broader lobbying and, and influencing role as well. And, and how is Visit Cornwall funded? It's funded from their membership, the members, that's the industry. Uh, occasionally, we do get money from Visit Britain and Visit England. Uh, that's for discrete project work, as well as um, we've had some European money. We're involved in a space project. Uh, and obviously, we've got some SPF money recently. But I just want to make it clear that although it's sort of private sector community interest company, none of our uh, non-executive directors get paid. They don't get expenses. They do it all for the love of looking after the sector. I, I noticed from your most recent accounts that last year you had uh, nearly £300,000 in administrative expenses, leading to a net loss for that year of about £100,000. What was that all about? Well, the administrative expenses are the cost of running us. So normally, if you look the year before, we would normally make anything from twenty to £80,000. We're not here to make a profit. Uh, last year was a combination of a new investment in a brand new website, and to be quite honest, some of the effects uh, of COVID, because when COVID carried on and everybody was doing very, very well, we lost out on membership. So uh, there was a hangover in a way from the good years, if you could say that, or the bad years, probably if you're a local, where people didn't have to work to get uh, business in. Now, you, you've mentioned um, the Shared Prosperity Fund. Do you get a lot of money from the taxpayer? Are you effectively a public body? No, we're not. We're a delivery body. Same as you were any other organisation outside, because it's not core funding. We have to a bid. We then have to be appraised. We then have a contract and we have to deliver the outputs and account for it. So we're a contract delivery with public funds. As you say, you, you left uh, the Cornwall Development Company, I suppose, about 10 years ago. Have you been disadvantaged over the past decade? Uh, and if not, why do you now need to be a part of the new economic forum? Well, the economic forum is more of a, an industry body to represent. So I think the visitor economy is there. Um, to put it in perspective, um, when I took over Visit Cornwall when it was in the CDC and the council back in 2010, the amount of public money going into that part and into our organisation was 2.1 million. When we left in 2015, it was 850,000. And, and therefore, you know, we've saved the taxpayer a lot of money. But obviously, when you used to have 68 staff and when we closed in the end uh, with 28 staff, we're now down to five and a half. So the disadvantage is it does limit what we can do on behalf of Cornwall. And I do mean those wider issues of sensible development, appraisal of planning, etc. So, yeah, we are disadvantaged. But it has saved the uh, saved the taxpayer of Cornwall over um, eight million pounds. Well, this is what I'm trying to be clear about. So you've been disadvantaged and it saved the taxpayer some money. We're now really turning the clock back, aren't we, and putting Visit Cornwall back inside County Hall. How is that going to change things? No, it's not back inside County Hall at all. The, there was a Dubois report, a national report commissioned by Department of Culture, Media and Sport into tourism structures in the UK because they're a bit of a mess or rather in England. And they came up with this concept of uh, local visitor economy partnerships because they recognise that bodies outside local authorities uh, could operate, but mainly on marketing and not influencing the wider agendas and particularly the development agenda. So the new local visitor economy partnerships, which Cornwall and City have been successful and we're the lead partner, means that we will evolve into a a body that represents the sector. So it's almost a, a widening role, but it can only happen with resources. So at the moment, and it's not inside the council, what it means is greater involvement with the council. Because for the last eight, nine years, they've basically turned around and said, well, tourism is really not a priority. Yeah, and? <laughs> and, you know, 
by and large, that's it. But what it does mean is that things like the planning department, the transport department, other departments have not been taken into account the impact of tourism, positive and negative. Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, it's, quite a few people would say um, the council's been quite right not to make tourism a priority. But I suppose it depends on how you define a priority, because it could mean prioritising things like registration schemes that you've been calling for for some years now. Uh, why has nothing happened? Um, basically, because nationally there's a reluctance to have any regulation at all. Um, they've, you know, to give you an idea, back in 2015, on a certain, you know, I'm not anti Airbnb, by the way, it's an international platform, we've got to live with it, but we've got to be able to, so I don't rant and rave about Airbnb, but there were about four or 500 Airbnbs in 2015, 16 in Cornwall. This year, there'll be 18,000. And they're not all second homes by a long way. A lot of them are locals. So that's the difference. Up until 2016, 17, the supply, the number of people who could come was limited by the supply. And what we've seen is that explosion. So why we've been lobbying for statutory registration is everybody should be on the same playing field. But once you've got that data, then you can look at smart controls. Because if we're going to avoid over tourism, we've got to control the supply of, of accommodation. Well, why is it then that places like Manchester and Liverpool and even Blackpool have been able to progress some sorts of schemes, usually through business investment districts, I think, based on registration. But Cornwall has not made progress. What, what are Manchester, Liverpool and Blackpool doing that we're not doing? Well, first of all, they are doing those projects and we've looked at them and spoke to them. Uh, and they're all about growing tourism, by the way. They just want to grow, 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 grow. We're looking at a scheme. It's a lot more complicated when you've got a county the size of Cornwall. And it's not all about hotels because we've got self-catering and holiday parks. So it's a lot more complex. So we are looking at, and doing some feasibility work. But we want a scheme where that money, you know, helps obviously in some aspects of tourism. But maybe three quarters of it goes towards supporting beach cleaning lifeguards, but also other environmental and community projects. Because me as a visitor, when I go somewhere and I give some money and people do say this, I want to make sure it goes to the community and helping the place. I don't want it to go into a bottomless pit or just to drive more and more growth in tourism. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to a, a tourist tourist taxes in, in, in a minute. <laughs> now, you've, you've been warning of over tourism, as you really did just then, for, for quite some time. Uh, your most recent report from Visit Cornwall says we get 24 million visitor nights in Cornwall a year. Bearing in mind, you just mentioned over tourism. What's the correct number? If 24 million visitor nights per year is too many, what should it be? Well, I'm now going to now going to confuse you a bit by saying probably around 30 to 35 million. <laughs> okay, probably about right. 30 million. But what we need to do is see a reduction in August. So what right. we need to look at is that with an aging population, digital nomads, I won't bore you with all the markets, we can have growth out of season, which will make a marginal difference. 46% right. of our visitors come in uh, July, August and September. Yeah. So, so OK, we, so, so if, if we're going to have uh, spread it out over the year, I understand the concept. But how are we going to shrink August? How are we going to say to people stop coming? No, no, it's not that. It goes back to the supply demand. So recently, uh, there was a big development proposed near Newquay. Um, we as Visit Cornwall, and 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 they are members, so it's interesting, or part of their organisation of members, said we couldn't support it until there'd been a proper supply and demand independent study done that it would not just grow the peak and it will, would not have adverse impacts on local transport and the community. Yeah, well, now, I mean, that, that development that you're talking about near Newquay is quite high profile because the council's, you know, strategic director for chief planning officer, effectively, has, has declared that he's in favour of it. You're not really on the same page as the council's own planning department, are you? Well, I hope we would be in the going forward. We've done similar things with like down at um, uh, the Pink House down on the Roseland. We've also put our concerns in about the Premier in in, in St Ives. So, you know, we, we, we're being consistent. Either prove it or it's not in the right place. Um, because it's very important that we, 
we really do um, manage tourism. Tourism can be a tool for the benefit of Cornwall or it can be a curse. Now, many people think it's a curse, but believe me, it does bring a lot of money in and that supports the high street, the pub and lots of other things. So, you know, we do need a certain level of tourism uh, for the benefit of us, um, but it's getting that balance right. I, I think one of the reasons that people see tourism as a curse is that they see County Hall as really very determined to go for growth, growth, growth. So uh, the council's economic development projects include things like the Saints Trail, a cycle path, which is primarily for for tourists rather than to help local residents commute to work, for example. We pay millions of pounds a year in subsidies to Newquay Airport. Primarily, those passengers are holidaymakers and second homeowners. There are other groups too, but they're the biggest single group, according to Eastern Airways. So we really need a change of attitude within County Hall, don't we? Well, I think that's what the whole principle of this document's about, which is, you know, has been discussed at the survey and was noted. Um, and we hope to move that forward as the local visitor economy partnership goes to make sure that we do make wise decisions. So some things are useful. Saints Way is a commuter route as well. Um, and, and the aspects around the airport are complex because other, other economic sectors say it's vital for them. And often the visitor is just to help sub, help reduce the subsidy. But we don't we don't promote um uh, air travel because what we want to do is get more and more people from within two or three hours of Cornwall to reduce the carbon footprint. Now I I, I take your point that some tourism it, it could certainly be a, a you know positive for Cornwall's economy, but there are doubts about exactly how much benefit and who benefits. I mean last year the council commissioned independent consultants to try to work it out, and they came up with a figure of nine hundred and fifty million pounds a year. Your figure is two billion pounds. That's quite a difference. You can't both be right. So what are you counting that the council's not counting? What we count at, at both levels is, and this is where it's the difference between GVA, gross added value, gross value added rather, and GDP. We the two the two billion is visitor spend. That's the amount visitors spend. The nine hundred odd, uh, roughly fifty percent, is what sticks in Cornwall because we don't right. produce and make everything that the, that, the, that the visitor economy needs, nor does any other sector. So that's what leaks out. So the, the, the net value, so it's a bit like your gross pay and your take home pay, if I can put it that way. Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I get it. I mean, it so, sounds so like use, maybe use, it, it's, maybe it's, maybe it's me. To, Right, Sorry, carry maybe, maybe it's me and my colleagues in the media who are simply misreporting all these figures then when we whenever we hear that easter made us 80 million pounds richer or whatever it was yeah. um in fact we shouldn't be saying we shouldn't be reporting those headline oh. figures because they're misleading it, it, no no it's not misleading cool you know i've been challenged on the 80 million i mean in the normal easter we would have made over 100 million because it was depressed that's made up of the average day visitors spending just over 20 pounds and a staying visitor for 24 hours spending £54. I think everybody would understand that's a reasonable figure. That money does go through the economy. It does go into people's wages, does go into when they buy things. The difference is, is what sticks in the Cornish economy, because if they buy, yeah. if they buy, I don't know if we grow blueberries, but if they grow blueberries or they're eating tuna, it's unlikely to have come from Cornwall. So that's the economics of this, of what sticks in the local economy. But what goes, I, I, th what goes through the till is 80 million. Right. Yeah. Well, this probably explains why I I feel um, that I must be missing out. Two billion pounds a year divided across a population of 570,000 suggests that everybody in Cornwall should be making about three and a half thousand pounds a year out of tourism. Now, I can promise you, Malcolm, somebody must be getting my share because I'm not making three and a half thousand pounds a year out of tourism. Where is the money going? It's a turnover. I mean, the, the the thing I'm passionate about and the reason why I keep plugging away is to get things like this approved and get these messages across I'm talking to you about because I'm passionate about Cornwall and getting the balance right. You know, a lot of it does go to, you know, I can tell you it's about 20, 24 percent goes to um, food and drink sector. You know, that's where the money goes. And if, if you look at the size of that sector, about 19 percent goes on retail. So it just boosts the retail sector. 
uh, and provides jobs. Um, it's about 50% goes on what you call normal tourism, if some people think, which would be accommodation and attractions. But that's where the money goes. The bit I'm passionate about is to keep small independent and local businesses in the sector and not have big international and national chains. Because I tell you what, that figure of 50% going out of the county would go up a lot if if we don't support the local independent businesses, because that goes straight out of the county. I mean, a particularly interesting um, detail here is not is the relationship between tourism and fishing. Um, I take your point, food and drink, um, restaurants and so on, clearly benefit from, from tourists. And so to some extent, Cornwall's association with having a fishing industry, the idea that you've got fresh fish in your restaurant is clearly helpful. But when we measure the value of tourism, how much of that is down to tourism and how much, say, of the fishing economy is down to just fishing? Because set against that is the perception that fishing communities all around the Cornish coast have been devastated by tourism. We used to have a fishing industry in places like Padstow and Port Isaac. And now we've two thirds of those areas are now second homes. Well, that's, that's a, it's a very complex question you've asked. So I'll answer it in different ways. If, and it's gonna be very boring because I've been on this for over a decade. <laughs> statute registration gets you the data, makes you do smart, intelligent planning restrictions. You know, you can't, you know, you can't just say to people, you can't have a second home, full stop. You have to have regulations about that. And, you know, and, and you know, it might be somebody wanting to return to Cornwall and all the rest of it. So I won't get too complex into that. So the second home debate is all about data and smart regulations. Uh, and we're more than happy with that. The fishing is very important. I mean, you know, it, it dwarfs in comparison to the visitor economy, even though it's sort of part of it. But I would put it right up there as a very critical part of the Cornwall brand. I've said this to the fish producers. You know, we know people want to go to fishing harbours. They want to go out buy local fish and all the rest of it. So it's the same with other local food. It's quite a tangled connection between the yeah, business. Yeah. Economy I mean, and I, business I, I know several fishermen who consider themselves really part of the tourist sector, yeah. rather, uh, although they go and catch lobsters and, and crabs all, all day. Uh, they, they really think that they exist the tourists rather than to catch fish yeah, yeah well, i mean our holiday makers love to eat local fish you know our holiday if you ask the supermarkets or other shops you know apart from christmas with locals you know the, the visitors tend to buy more local produce than us locals mainly because it does cost more uh, and a few other things so you know that's where the connections but, are there that's why let, let me give you another thing, another example of, right. of, sorry let me give you another example of how tourism um, is is used to justify things that sometimes, you know, perhaps with hindsight, we wonder why why did we do that? Last year, the council spent six hundred thousand pounds on a military parade in, in Falmouth, Armed Forces Day, and part of the justification was that it was going to bring in six million pounds. So where did that money go? Why are the streets of Falmouth not paved with gold? Why are people in Falmouth still sleeping rough? Why are the pubs closing? You know, if you spread it out amongst the entire population of Falmouth, it should be about £240 each. It didn't happen. Why not? Well, there was no, as far as I know, there's the evaluation or there wasn't one. So that's difficult to say without the data. But on other exercises like tool ships or whatever, we do evaluate. There are people interviewing in the streets and it's it's calculated. That was based on previous events. And it does come down to things like 15, 18 pounds spent per person. Uh, it's just the volume of people. You know, the thing about holidaymakers and day, and let's face it, there are 25 million staying visitor days. There's 14 million day visitor days. That's mainly us. So you and I probably go out, I don't know, I can't. Wouldn't like to accuse you of having a drink and a meal, uh, but, <laughs> but we do have a drink and a meal, and we go somewhere else in Cornwall and we spread the money around. So that's the that's the challenge: is that lots of small purchases right across the economy. Many parts of the world have had a local tax on tourism for decades. Why do you say it won't work in Cornwall? Oh, it could work in Cornwall, but it would have to be a national scheme, because that's the way our government works. Um, but I would say, um, so I'm going to tackle this two ways. I think working on some very good, smart levy that's the same amount of money that's raised solely to target supporting certain aspects of the visitor economy, but more importantly, community projects and environmental projects is a smarter way of doing it. 
because you 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 know people could be concerned about controlling the growth of money um of of, of uh, tourism if there's a local tax nationally they're very keen on growing tourism because it adds tax there's about three four hundred million a year goes in tax from cornwall to westminster so if there's a local tax i don't mean to be um be naughty but somebody locally might go oh we need more money into the tax regime let's have more tourists so yes it could work it would have to be national but if it was national it would just disappear into a black hole there's already a chunk of money goes to london we would normally argue that should some of that should come back but i think we all know that the state of national bank balance so yes yes there could be the government could do it if they were minded this government is not minded to do it i would prefer a, a levy where not only local people but holiday makers know where that money goes I mean, the central government, there might be a change of central government, you know, within the next 12 months, um, could devolve to uh, local authorities the discretion to to set their own uh, level of tourist tax. So, for example, Cornwall, a desirable holiday destination, might be worthy of a higher level of tourist tax than, say, Birmingham. Yes. Um, and, you know, and as I said, we already pay a lot of tax already. It's one of the second ta highest taxed economies, visitor economies in Europe uh, and probably quite high in the world. Nobody's done that calculation. So first of all, it is taxed. It just doesn't stick in Cornwall. Um, I think they, they could do it. I think the issue to my mind is what would that money be used for? And does that actually... Well, that would be that would be down to the local authority then, wouldn't it? Well, that would also give an incentive to keep growing tourism. Um, it, 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 in, in, indeed, it, it, it would. It would. But at least then the, there would be some money coming in to pay for things like uh, sewerage schemes and extra hospital capacity. We wouldn't have to keep putting up car parking charges every year. We wouldn't have to cut school buses, you know. If it was a pound a night per person, that'd still only be 25 million quid. Now, you can do a lot. You can do a lot for community and environmental schemes. That's not going to get your hospital. It's not going to clean up air seas. So... I think the fallacy and also got to ask people, do you want 20, 30 percent more holiday makers in your area so that we get a little bit of taxation in? So it's not I don't think it's a sweet. I'm not I'm not saying it's, you know, I just think we've got to think these things through about the law of unintended consequences. Well, I mean, the, the reason we're having this conversation now is because of the huge protest there was in the Canary Islands at the, at the weekend and uh, residents on the Canary Islands want a tourist tax there, like their Spanish colleagues in Mallorca and Barcelona and, and elsewhere. And it looks like that political agitation probably is bringing about change now in the Canary Islands. Do we need political agitation in Cornwall to bring about a tourist tax? I, there's enough hate in this world. The thing about these things, and that's, what I'm, that's why I wrote to you, you know, these are holiday makers. You get people going tourist and visitor and it's, it's quite nasty really these are people coming on holiday now we need to get the right balance we've already talked about that so let's get this right these aren't aliens these are our fellow you know 95 percent our fellow brits so you know and and if the if the anger is about second homes if the anger is about you know the the the, the issues we're talking about then let's look at a levy let's look at these things but get it right but I don't like this thing about this us and them that seems to be happening all around the world. You know, oh, it, oh, I mean, a, a, a large easy, part, a large part of the to, Canary Islands protest was people holding up placards saying tourists go home. Yes. And the other people saying we love our tourists and want them to come. So if you want to damage, if you want to damage Skinner's Brewery, if you want to damage all these things, then we drive visitors away and our holiday makers away. We were perfectly fine, and I've been around a long time. We we're perfectly fine and comfortable with visitors up until the pandemic, maybe 2018, 19, because of the uh, online platforms, it was getting out of hand. We can get back there. We can get back to the right balance. We can actually go in a new direction. Um, but just generating this thing of, you know, let's get rid of tourism and everything will be fine. I remember Cornwall when it's had its troubles. Um, and you can't deny the number, you know, when we did a community attitude study in 2012 and 2021, right in the pandemic, you know, it was 28% of households partially 
or fully depend on the visitor economy for some of their income or all of their income. So we've got to be very careful about getting this. We've got to, this is about visitor management and about a visitor economy strategy. It's not about let's get rid of them all. That's a bit, and it's actually quite nasty and horrible. I mean, if what? somebody's living in Swindon and wants to come down and spend a week in Cornwall to make memories with their family, come off it, people of Cornwall. I know you don't mean that. What um, what's going to happen next? Then you've got your uh, you've got your plan that you've shown yeah. us for 2030. Um, you're, you're, you've now you're, you're, you've now got a seat at the table in the economic forum. Um, so your voice is going to be heard more loudly than uh, your your years outside, as it were. What happens next? When will we see um, a regulated, managed tourism industry that works for the public benefit? Correctly, that's what it should be. It should be a benefit. It should be great holidays. Yeah, well, you, 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 well, I think we probably agreed that yeah. it should be. It's not happening now, though, is it? And and, and so, yeah, when are we I, going to see? Mo no, that's a little slow. It it is. It just it has been there before. It's returning to there before. Everybody's got the scars of COVID years. <clears throat> I I I would say to anybody, including yourself, Graham, that you go on holiday somewhere else. Uh, and everybody else goes on a holiday somewhere else. So let's get this. It's a very important part of a mixed economy. But answering your question precisely, we can say that when we ran that economic forum, this the, these principles are what will be driving our voice. So it will be about low carbon regenerative tourism, which is, you know, tourism has been destructive and we've seen destructive, destructive tourism during so and so it can be sustainable we want to make it regenerative fancy word but it means it's got the right balance and it's doing good that's the voice we'll be adding to that 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 um that forum all right now um talking about things which are sustainable you're very sustainable aren't you um i remember talking to you in 2022 and you were telling me all about your retirement yes. and yet here and yet here you are I, now, I can't think of anybody who could do your job better than you do it, but how much longer are you going to stay sitting in the saddle? Well, first of all, I'm now only part time and I'm the, I'm the exec chair, so they wouldn't let me go and I didn't really want to go. Having having been passionate about balance in tourism and I've been, you know, I was on the European Commission advisory panel for 12 years on this whole agenda. When it came to, you know, uh, and I'm 69 this year, so I, I would quite like to walk away. But it was too much of an opportunity with the visitor economy getting close to getting a statutory registration scheme agreed to walk away at that time. So if you want to ask me an ideal picture when I walk away in the sunset will be when hopefully the government gives us a decent statutory registration scheme. This is fully embedded in policies in, in Cornwall and that we have a levy scheme that's contributing or we've looked and done our best to get a levy scheme that helps communities and the environment in Cornwall. Then I'll leap on that horse and gallop away at the quickest rate of that. <laughs> and when you go on holiday, where do you go? The Isles of Scilly. Um, <laughs> I have not been abroad other than work for 10 years, but that's just because I love the area. I have been abroad. <laughs> I've been abroad before I've traveled a lot in my past. And I enjoy traveling, uh, so I don't blame anybody. I, all I ask people to do is have a good look at how those hospitality workers are treated and other things where they go and the I, regime I, I, and the regimes you're supporting where you go. But apart from that, enjoy travel and enjoy meeting other people, but equally enjoy meeting people here or on holiday as well. Malcolm, thank you very much for your time. You've been very generous with your time this morning. I think we've all got the message. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you, Graham.